filters. So the topic of filters is explained pretty well in your textbook yeah. in this area. Just go ahead and let's take a look at this real quick. And it's on chapter 26. So chapter 26 in your uh, e-book on page 607 is where the topic of filters begins. And the significance of filters for electronic technicians is you're going to find filters in all aspects of electronics. Uh, either filters are used for tuning. Right here, filters are used for uh, tuning. So tuning is uh, how your radio works. So when you are dialing a certain radio station, you are dialing, adjusting a filter so that it will pick up that particular frequency for the music station that you want. Filters also have another application. The filters are used in a variety of aspects of um, sound filtering. And uh, the most practical application I can explain and I've explained to you before were parts of the speaker system. The speaker system has different parts. And so we would use low pass filters for the woofer area. We would use and then this to show the frequency response for a low pass filter. So the, the, the textbook does a really, really nice job of showing you low pass filters, uh, showing you high pass filters, showing you uh, band pass filters shaped like this. Uh, and then also another type of filter, band reject uh, filters, which is like this. So the task at hand is really learn how these filters work by looking at the circuits that are involved, by looking at the circuitry. So by looking at the schematic, what's hooked up to what, you should be able to tell based on how, how reactance works, how filters work. And I will go to, uh, to begin that explanation for you. Okay. Now, so back to filters. So the introduction is with filters. We're going to focus our attention on L, P, F, H, P, F. So this is your low pass filter. This is your high pass filter. High pass filter. And let me check on something here. Yeah, high pass filter. And then we have BPF, which is your band pass filter. Pass a filter. And then you have a BSF slash BRF. So this is those two names. It could be called a band stop filter. Um, bound. Okay, could you mute your microphone? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, just mute your microphone. Thank you. Uh, this is a band stop filter. Uh, it could also be known as a band reject filter. So those are the names that are given to the filters that we're most interested in. And the one that's specifically used for radio is this one here. This is your bandpass filter is used for radio frequencies. And when I say radio frequencies, I'm talking about frequencies that uh, are for AM radio, FM radio, ham radio, television, cellular. So if you're on a cell phone, you've got a bandpass filter working in your cell phone to pick up the specific frequency for Verizon or for T-Mobile or um, whatever other carrier that you might be using. So they're, they're very specific filters tuned to very specific frequencies. Collectively, they all work this way. So let me help you out here. Is I'm going to show you something called a
a frequency response graph, an FRG, if you will. And a frequency response graph will be graphed this way. You'll be able to see, you'll be able to see um, a vertical axis, you'll see a horizontal axis, Axis. The horizontal axis, and these have to have labels. The horizontal axis will be labeled F in units of hertz for frequency. The vertical axis will be labeled amplitude and that's typically in units of V for volts or capital B, lowercase d, decibels. So let's talk a little bit about amplitude. And put that in a square. So amplitude is simple, simply signal strength. How strong is that signal? That's what amplitude is. So the higher it is, the stronger the signal, the lower it is, the weaker the signal. And that is measured in units of volts, or it could also be measured in other units called decibels. So how many of you have been uh, at live music performances, uh, rock concerts, things of that sort? Gabe, Christian, anybody? Been a while, but yeah. Okay, been clubbing, standing next to the speaker stack. When you go clubbing and, and, and with, with friends and such, do you stand right next to the speaker stack? I did once. It was not a good idea. No, yeah, right. <laughs> because because it was not a good idea, it was probably because it, it, it hurt your eardrums, yes? Because the volume was pretty loud. Yeah. And so that volume is measured in decibels. And that decibel level, uh, standing right next to the speakers is probably in excess of 100 decibels. When you are on the um, uh, airport tarmac, if you're one of our friends that are working on the airport tarmac, uh, and I have friends that, that, that you know, move luggage on and off of planes, they have to wear hearing protectors. And as they do, uh, the reason why they do is because of their proximity to the jet engines. When those jet engines get going, they get well beyond 140 decibels. So, so decibels is, is, is very commonly used as a measure of signal strength. Uh, it, it, voltage is also another one. So the vertical axis represents a quantity known as what? It's called amplitude. Amplitude is another word for what? Signal strength. The horizontal axis is a lowercase f for frequency measured in hertz. Now, very simply, I'm not going to put numbers on here, but but conceptually, what I'm going to put is low frequencies on this side and put high frequencies on this side. Okay. And if we think in terms of audio, if we think in terms of audio, not everything is measured with respect to audio frequencies, but if we think about audio, audio is defined as the range of frequencies, range of frequencies that humans can hear. Range of frequencies that humans can hear. And what is that range of frequencies that humans can hear? It's stated, who remembers? Pauline, do you remember? It's a uh... Uh, it goes from something to something. What would be the low end, do you recall? Uh, I mean, uh, Starts with a two. Yeah, two zero hertz. Yeah. Two zero hertz, 20 hertz. And then the upper end for, is, oh, very close. 20,000. 20 kilohertz, okay. That's the range of frequencies humans are supposed to be able to hear. And as it turns out, uh, gals can hear closer to the upper range than, than guys can. Um, don't know if that's a genetic thing, but uh, it turns out to be uh, the case. Uh, and, but especially with, with uh, guys, uh, we abuse our, our hearing. And, and so 
um, it diminishes quite a bit in terms of frequency uh, with uh, males versus females. And then also for both males and females, that upper end diminishes uh, to 19 kilohertz, 18, 17, 16 kilohertz, it diminishes uh, with age. Okay, so low frequencies on this side of the chart, high frequencies on this side of the chart, and now let's see how each one of these shapes fits into this chart. Okay. And we did. Identify. Right here. This would be defined as a low pass filter. Why is this a low pass filter? If I can low frequencies on this side, high frequencies on this side, is the shaded area, the blue, dark blue shaded area, shows the range of frequencies that have been passed. And then anything outside of the dark shaded area are frequencies that have been rejected, frequencies that are not passed. Output signal strength is here and frequency range is here, low to high. So in what part of this range from low to high, what part of this range from low to high is the majority of the blue shading occurring? The majority of the blue shading is significant on this side of the frequency response graph, yes? So if the majority of the blue shading is dominant here near the low end, then this would be called a what? a low pass filter. So this would be the shape of a low pass filter. If, and, and one example of how to build a low pass filter would be something very simple like this. Here I have a coil, here I have a resistor, and based on the position, the coil being here and the resistor being here, I have and can construct this kind of filter. Now we'll show you how this works in just a moment and why this happens to match. Okay, so we'll take this one filter at a time and see how this circuit gives us this frequency response graph. So this is your V output, and this is your V input. So let's say, and this is an L and this is an R, and this signal coming in is going to be a sine wave signal. And let's say that it is from 20 to 20 kilohertz. So this is very similar to what would come out of your amplifier. Your amplifier will have full range of sound processing your MP3s or processing your, your, your uh, surround sound video, whatever it is that, that is being amplified. It's going to be fed into this circuit with a coil and a resistor. And let's see how this coil and resistor behave. There is, there are ohms that are represented by the resistor. So there's going to be ohms over here. And the inductor by itself, L, stands for the magnetic characteristics of this device. We're interested in the ohms. Uh, we're interested in something called reactance. So we're interested in something called X sub L. X sub L. It's based on inductance. And there's a formula that you've seen before, I will reiterate it here. X sub L is calculated as two times pi, get your calculators ready, times L, times F, times L. Does this look a little similar to the one that we played with for capacitive reactants? A little similar. This is called inductive reactants. And this is defined at opposition to 
AC current. Opposition to current. If you had a, um, and fundamentally, let's look at how this, the part that I want for you to realize here is the relationship between X sub L, and the way we pronounce this, this is pronounced as X sub L. So that's how you would read this. X sub L is the symbol we use to represent inductive reactants. There is a very unique relationship between X sub L and frequency. What do we see here that is different from the capacitors? What we see here is this. If my L is constant, I don't change this. Pi is constant, two is constant. If I only change frequency, how will X sub L change? If I increase frequency, how will X sub L change? If I increase this, what happens on this side of the equation? Christian? Gabriel? Andrew? What do you think will happen? This is an equation now. One side is equal to the other. That's what an equation is. So this side has to equal this side. If I increase the F, what will happen to my X sub L? Will increase too. It will increase. What happens if I decrease my F on this side? What has to happen on this side? Will decrease. Decrease. Will decrease. Will we'll go down. Are, so the for, relationship for that we see. Yes, you, you, were, you were about to add a comment, Rolando? Yeah, they are direct, direct proportional. Direct. That's correct. Excellent. X sub L and F are, and the phrase we use is this, directly proportional. They are directly proportional. What does this mean? This means if frequencies, frequencies, and I'm going to use an arrow, go down, comma, then X sub L will also go down. If frequencies go up, comma, then X sub L goes up. Why? Because they are directly proportional. That's the key phrase. This is significantly different from the circuit that we had in our exercise. The circuit that we had in our phase shift exercise was this. Resistor here, so there was a C. We had a signal source here. Here's your R. And again, in the presence of AC, so your V in is here, and then out here would be your V out, measured between these two. We're not interested so much in the capacitance, we're interested in how the ohms behave with respect to this. There is a characteristic you can calculate called X sub C. X sub C, if you recall, X sub C was one over two pi F C. And here, this is called capacitive reactance. And this is pronounced as X sub C. That's how it's pronounced. And what is the relationship between X sub C and F? X sub C and F are something. If I were to increase F, what happens to X sub C? If I were to decrease F, what happens to X sub C? Remember, F is now in a denominator. 
Who's got a comment? Inversely proportional. That's correct. They are called inversely proportional. What does inversely proportional mean? This means if frequencies go down, comma, then x sub c goes up. It behaves in the opposite direction. And conversely, this means if frequencies go up, comma, then x sub c goes down. Inversely proportional means that the frequency and reactance behave opposite of each other. So the relationship that you have here is that these are inversely proportional. Very important concept when we look at how these guys are going to behave. Question so far. Okay, let's go on to the next page. So we're going to continue with this and explain how this becomes a low pass filter. So you have R, and we'll have an X sub C. And so what I want you to think about is with respect to frequency, I'm sorry, not X sub C. Been on it for a couple of weeks here. X sub L. So with respect to frequency, the ohms will change. As frequency goes up, ohms will go up. As frequencies go down, ohms will go down. So you want to think of this guy behaving, behaves like this. What is a resistor with a diagonal through it? Anytime you have an electronic component with a diagonal through it, that means this is variable. Variable ohms. That's how this guy is going to behave. And your V out is over here. So as the ohms change, we'll dictate how this will work for us. So let's go ahead and look at two scenarios. Let's say we happen to have at some point low ohms because we have low frequencies. Low F gives us low ohms. Here's your V out. And then the converse over here The out over here, we have an R, we have an R, and here we have high frequencies. And at high frequencies, your X of L is equal to high ohms. And here your X of L is equal to low ohms. Now let's put in some hypotheticals. Let's say just for the sake of discussion, this guy is fixed at 1,000 ohms. This guy's fixed at 1,000 ohms. And at low frequencies, let's say this guy goes really low, and let's say how low, well, let's say 10 ohms, something really low. Over here, how high can it go? Mm, let's say something really high. Let's say 100k ohms. Based on this, 
what it is that you have when you go to measure what voltage will come out of these two terminals is based on voltage divider formula. Remember, the DF, which stands for voltage divider formula. And voltage divider formula was V across some unknown resistor will be equal to that resistor value over the total times voltage total. So we're just going to stick in some hypothetical numbers. Let's go ahead and stick in um, 10 volt peak. And here's a 10 volt peak. So we have a 10 volt peak signal being introduced. Never mind the frequency. I'm just simply saying low frequencies here, high frequencies here, no numbers. The only numbers is at low frequencies, we know that X of L will be low. And how low? Hypothetically, let's say it goes down as low as 10. The other side of the frequency spectrum on our frequency response graphs would be high. So in high frequencies, we know that our X of L ohms will be high. Why? Because for coils, that characteristic for X of L, for inductive reactants, we said earlier was what? They were directly proportional. As frequencies go down, X of L goes down. As frequency goes up, X of L goes up. So that being said, let's see how this plays out. What would be the total ohms in this particular scenario? The total ohms in this particular scenario is 1,010 ohms, yes? Because they're in series. Let's just say, for the sake of discussion, somewhere close to 1,010 ohms. We, we know we can't add them up because there's reactance issues. But the, just, just, just for the simplicity's sake, let's say that if we could, we have something similar to this. In a deeper discussion, we would do phase calculations. We would calculate an actual voltage, but we don't have to do this right now. We're just going to go the simple route in order to determine how a, a filter works. So since they're in series, we know they're going to add. Mathematically, we should be using phaser analysis using a little bit of uh, um, a Pythagorean theorem. But we're going to skip that just for simplicity's sake and say, I got 10 ohms here. I got 1,000 ohms here something not far away from 1,010 ohms. How do I do my calculation and determine what my voltage is going to come out? Well, let's show you. In this particular scenario, my VR is going to be equal to the 1,000, approximately the 1,000 over 1,010, and it's going to multiply by the 10 volt peak. So why don't you all try that on your calculators. Take 1,000, divide by 1,010, multiply by 10. And Mr. Wenbin Lau, what do you have for the calculation, my friend? Bunch in 1,000. Divide by 1,010? Nine, nine, uh, nine volt? Is it 10? Yeah, well, uh, it, it works 9. out to 9. be, yeah, something close to 9.9 9 volts. Something close to 9.9 9 volts, okay, at low frequencies. Now, could we do the same analysis over here at high frequencies? Because we said, hypothetically, how high can it go? Well, let's say it goes as high as 100K and here. So what is my, uh, my ohms total? My ohms total is, again, we should be using Pythagorean theorem and calculate this out with a little more math. But again, we're going to do this quick and easy and just add these two together and you end up with 101 kilo ohms. 100 plus 1K is 101K. That being said, speaker, that's me. All right, now let me move this 
off site to here so I can see everybody. Okay, can everybody see the paper okay now? All right, so now if we apply our voltage divider formula here, my VR is going to be equal to 1K over 101K times 10 volt peak. So 1 divided by 101, because don't the Ks cancel? I submit to you that the Ks will cancel. So the simple math is simply 1 divided by 101. And if you do this, Gabe Orozco, 1 divided by 101 times 10. I got 99.9. Uh, milli, milli ohms. Volts. Volts, sorry. Okay, so you get 99.01 millivolt peak. Is that even one volt peak? Is this even one? This is less than one volt peak. How much did we have here? Almost 10. So how does this plot out? If you were to plot this out, and let's say you had 10 volts here, and you had a frequency response over here, you have to write F, you have to write this in Hertz, and all we, all we have to write down here is low F. All we have to write down here is high F. What happens at low F? At low F, we happen to have, uh, at low F, we happen to have low X sub L. At high F, we happen to have high x sub l. Is that the case? At low frequencies, didn't we have low ohms? At high frequencies, didn't we have high ohms? But where are those ohms in this relationship? Are the ohms that are changing, are the variable ohms, these ohms right here, are they changing on the output or are they changing elsewhere in the circuit? They're not changing on the output. The output is fixed at 1,000 ohms. But what will the voltage be like in this case? We said if these ohms go low and you have high ohms here, where is most of the voltage going to be dropped? Most of this 10 volts will always go to where there's the most ohms. And that's why your output between these two terminals is going to be up here. So you're going to have something known as you're going to have you're going to have something right now. I'm in class, son. Okay. So what what it is that you're going to have right here is this will be your V out equals high. Okay. The V out in this case that's almost ten. It's going to be high. So we're just going to mark a little red line there. Over here at high frequencies, we said the coil, because of where it sits, that's where the ohms are variable. And as this, as we have lots of ohms here, where is most of this 10 volts going to be dropped between the 100K and the 1K? Most of this is going to be dropped across this guy, leaving you very little left across the resistor, very little across the output. In fact, we calculated less than one volt peak on the output. So we started with 10, and on the output, in this case, we have less than one. So here you would have a V out that is low. In fact, it is less than one volt peak. And over here, this was very high, and this was very close to, very close to 9.9 .9 volt peak. So I'm going to put a little line here. So at low frequencies, low ohms on the coil. Low ohms on the coil means most of that voltage will be across the resistor. That means our V out is going to be very high. Put a little red line here. At high frequencies, we have high ohms on the coil, so high X of L. But those ohms sitting up here 
are going to be taking the majority of the voltage drop from the 10 volts, leaving you very little left over across the R. So your output across the R is going to be very low, in this case, less than one. So I'm going to put this guy here. If I go to connect this with an S-shaped curve, there's my S. Does this represent low pass or high pass filter? Low pass or high pass filter? And I bring us back to the illustration that's in the book. The majority of uh, our frequency that is nice and high happens to be on the low frequency end and it curves down this way and you have what's known as a low pass filter as a result. So this particular circuit, because of where we place the coil and the resistor and we look at this range of frequencies, gives us something we have over here known as an LPF. LPF is your low pass filter. Good so far? Any questions so far? Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to take the cap, I'm going to take the coil and the uh, resistor. There's my AC signal. I'm going to put my resistor here, put my coil here. Here is where I will have X sub L. Here is where I will have R. And between these two terminals here will be my V out. This is my V in. And again, hypothetically, we'll say we have a 10 volt peak. What happens here? Now this behaves like this. It behaves like variable ohms variable ohms, except these variable ohms are not at the top of the circuit. These variable ohms are now on the output. So as these ohms change, they directly affect the output. Let's see how it behaves. Let's see what would happen. So given this, this is going to behave in one of two different fashions. We already said at low frequencies, comma, X sub L is equal to low or high ohms. Andrew, low or high ohms. At low frequencies, X sub L behaves like low or high ohms. Uh, high ohms. It does the opposite, right? This is a coil. And a coil, X sub L and F are what? Oh, they're the same. Directly proportional. So that means as frequency goes down, X sub L must go? Down. Down, okay. So what we say over here, at low frequencies, X sub L is equal to low ohms. Okay, okay. At high frequencies, my X sub L is equal to, and when bin low, am I going to have high frequencies or low frequencies here at high frequencies? Am I going to have low ohms or high ohms? When bin low? High ohms? High ohms is correct. High ohms. Now, let's pop in some hypothetical numbers here and see this plays out. Again, let's say that this guy was 1,000 ohms. And let's say this is R is equal to 1,000 ohms. And how low can it go? Well, let's say it goes to 10 ohms. How high can it go? Well, let's say it goes up to 100K ohms. We're just going to use the same numbers. And the source is still going to be a 10 volt peak. So that way we don't have to recalculate our numbers. And again, 
the proper way to do this is with Pythagorean theorem in order to calculate total ohms. Total ohms are known as what? Impedance. So we're just going to do this fast and easy and say our total ohms here. So ohms total equals Z, which is equal to impedance. And impedance has a formula. Impedance was given as the square root of r squared plus x squared. Okay, so we can calculate that out if we wanted to, or we can approximate for this particular discussion. We're just going to approximate um, that x of l plus r is not that far away from z. So if we approximate, in this case, we happen to have a Z that is approximately 100 and, uh, 1,010 ohms, yes? So what would we calculate our V out to be? So what's my VR in this case? VR is going to be equal to, uh, actually, my V out. I'm going to change this up a little bit. My V out is equal to V X sub L, because my voltage out is equal to the voltage across this guy. And this is going to be equal to, approximately equal to, X sub L over the total ohms times your voltage source. So this is approximately equal to, to 10 over 1,010 and if you go to calculate this, are we going to end up with our little 99 millivolts? Okay, because that's what we calculated before. What happens over here at high frequencies? At high frequencies, then your X of L is going to be high. How high can it be? Uh, it could be, say, 100K. So your V out in this case is equal to, again, your V X of L over z, this is approximately equal to, times vs. So this is approximately equal to 100k over 101k times 10. And when we go to do this, we end up with the numbers here, something close to 9.9 .9 volt peak is your v out. And this was the v out at low frequencies. We go to plot this guy onto a frequency response graph. There we go. F in units of Hertz. And we have low F on the side and we have high F on the side. I'm concerned about my V out. At low frequencies, at low frequencies, X of L is going to be low ohms because X of L is on the output. It's on the output. That means that our V out is the voltage across X of L. And if we calculate low ohms over the total, we'll have very, very low voltage out. That's going to be tiny. So if my total here is 10 volts max, this guy here is going to be right down there. Let's see what happens at high frequencies. At high frequencies, high frequencies, X of L is equal to, so at high frequencies, X of L is equal to high ohms. How high? Well, we said uh, throw in a number 100K. And so we said that our output measured between these two tabs is across our variable ohms. That's going to be equal to approximately X of L over the total times Vs. And now you have something, a V out, that's very close to 10. This is a very high output. Very high output. So I'm going to my red line here. 
at high frequencies, my V out is going to be equal to high. At low frequencies, my V out equals low. How do I connect this with an S? If I connect this with an S, whoa, interesting. What kind of a filter have we conjured up here? What range of frequencies is highest? Is low frequencies the, the big part of the shaded area of this graph? Or at high frequencies is the large shaded area of this graph? It turns out to be high frequencies. So what type of filter, what type of frequencies is being passed in this particular case? This would be known as an HPF, which is a what? A high pass filter. And does this suspiciously look a lot like this guy here. Low frequencies, low amplitude, high frequencies, high amplitude. This is called high pass filters. A couple of ways of building this. One way of building this is with a capacitor and a resistor. The other way to build this is with a coil. And so we can have a resistor and a coil. And so we, we happen to have chosen something similar to this design, and we achieved this type of frequency. We achieved this type of frequency response. So this is identified as high pass filter. So we have looked at and configured we have looked at and configured two different circuits. One circuit had the coil at the top of the circuit and the resistor at the output. With the coil at the top of the circuit and the resistor at the output, if we go to do this analysis, we determine this becomes a low pass filter. If we simply switch the position of the coil and the resistor, put the resistor at the top, put the coil on the output, we end up with this resistor at top, coil on the output. And if we go to analyze and compare, Low frequencies, low ohms, high frequency, high ohms. But where are the ohms that are being changed? The ohms that are being changed are no longer at the top. The ohms that are being changed are on the output. And our voltage measured is across those ohms that are changing. So if I have low ohms on the output, I will have low voltage on the output. If I have high ohms on the output, I will have high voltage on the output. And so based on the frequency that causes these ohms to change, this results in a high pass filter. So the only difference between the low pass that we had a moment ago and the high pass filter that we have now yeah, between the resistor and the coil is a simple switch of the position of the coil to here. So here's the thing. What is it that you need to understand from electronics point of view is not memorize. Well, if the coil's on the output, I'm going to have this. And if my resistor's on the output, I'm going to have this. No, not to memorize the circuit, but to understand how reactance behaves with frequency. And we have two different kinds of reactants. We happen to have two different kinds of reactants. Uh, we happen to have, yes, X sub L inductive reactants where X sub L and frequency are directly proportional. And then we also have X sub C, X sub C, where called capacitive reactants, where X sub C and F are inversely proportional. So, so far, we've only looked at two filters and the two filters are coil and resistor in this arrangement, giving us a low pass. If I switch that arrangement around coil and resistor put coil on the output, I have this type of filter. Any questions so far? Next. Hmm. 
my R is here, my X sub C is going to be here, 10 volt peak is going to here, and I will have my V out across my resistor, which is going to be fixed. So this behaves like the following. Where's my cap? My cap is at the top. Because my cap is at the top, the component at the top of the circuit behaves like a variable ohmic device. The ohms that are attached to my Vout, these are, this one's going to be fixed. So one's going to be fixed and one's going to be variable. Okay. So that being said, how can this guy behave? Well, we're going to take this. You're going to, you can't tell by looking at this, is this going to be a high pass or a low pass? But what you can do is the methodical step-by-step -step, what happens. And why are we taking two paths? Why are we looking at two separate examples? Because in one example, this side is going to represent what? Low frequencies. And the other example, this side is going to represent what? High frequencies. Now, we are talking about a capacitor in this case. Capacitor X sub C, what was the formula? 1 over 2 pi F C. How is frequency and these ohms related? Are they directly proportional or inversely proportional? Pauline. They're, in, they're inversely proportional. They're inversely proportional. So as they are inversely proportional, uh, with low frequencies, we expect X sub C is going to be equal to what? High ohms. And with high frequencies, your X sub C is going to be equal to low ohms. Is that a reasonable expectation, everybody? Does that show an inversely proportional relationship? At when frequency goes low, ohms go high. When frequencies go high, X sub C ohms go low. And this is behavior is only for a capacitor. With a coil, they were directly proportional. So now let's analyze where these ohms are. These ohms are at the top of the circuit. How does that compare with the ohms that are going to be found here? Well, let's analyze this. Uh, let's go ahead and draw this out. And here's the R, and again, let's go ahead and use our hypothetical value we used a little while ago, and let's call that 1K ohms. And high frequencies, how high can things go? Well, our X of C, let's say hypothetically, it goes up to 100K ohms. And this is our 10 volt source. So what will my V out be? Most of the ohms are here. This is steady at 1K. Where is the majority of my voltage going to be? Is my majority of the voltage going to be on the low ohms? Or is my majority of the voltage going to be on the high ohms? How does voltage divider split that voltage? Rolando. I got 10 volts here, lots of ohms here, little ohms here. Where is most of the voltage going to be divided? Uh, let me see. Uh, it's, going be, it's going to be high, not low voltage. Those. Is that true? Won't most of the voltage be across X of C because I have most of the voltage, most of the ohms here? Okay. Yeah. The bigger the ohms, the more voltage will be found across that component. 
So most of the voltage will be across X sub C. This leaves. That'd be the path of less resistance, right? No, don't, let's not use that phrase because path of least resistance is a very popular phrase, but it doesn't apply here because we're not talking about current flow. We're talking about, because uh, current is the same in a series circuit. Uh, path of less resistance is something that's more, more appropriate for a parallel circuit. Uh, so in a voltage divider, the bigger the ohms, the bigger the voltage drop. And so here I have big ohms. That's where most of the voltage is going to be. If most of the voltage is going to be across X sub C, that leaves very little, very little voltage on V out. That means this, my V out here, is going to be equal to low. What will happen over here at high frequencies? Well, let's see. Here's my cap. Here's my R. And here's my vote measured between here and here. And here's my X sub C. So we said that X sub C and F, these guys were inversely proportional. So what does that mean? Well, at high frequencies, at high frequencies, we have low ohms. How low can this go? I don't know. Unless this goes down to 10 ohms. This guy's fixed at 1K. This guy's still 10 volt peak. So what happens in this particular scenario? Where do I have most of the ohms now? 10 ohms here, 1,000 ohms over here. Where are the majority of my ohms? Andrew. The 1,000 ohms. The 1,000 ohms. That's big. That's compared to 10. That's big. So we have is most ohms across R. So most voltage. will be across R, so V out is going to be very high. And mathematically, if we wanted to play that guy out, this would look something like this. The numbers are very similar. So your V out in this particular case is approximately, and again, we should do this with Pythagorean theorem, but quick and easy, we'll just do it this way, is approximately 1K over uh, 1010 ohms, and this will be times 10 volt peak. And this is approximately, we calculated earlier, a 9.9 .9 volt peak. Is that most of the 10? Isn't most of that 10 volts dropped across the output? because I have lots of ohms here. So my V out is going to be very high. So if I go to put this guy on a chart like so, and here's my F in Hertz. Here's my low on this side. Here's my high on this side. And here's my V out. So at low frequencies, low frequencies is on this side of the chart my output is going to be what? Low. So that means I'm going to mark my red line here. At high frequencies, X sub C is going to be low because they're inversely proportional. But where are those low ohms? Those low ohms are up here at the top of the circuit. Where is the majority of my ohms? The majority of my ohms are here. So most of that 10 is going to be found here on these output taps close to this. So that means at high frequencies, I'm going to have a fairly high voltage out. So I'm going to draw a line right here. How do I connect these two? Oh, what type of a filter does that look like to you? Rolando. Well, 
Rolando. Gabriel, what's it look like to you? I pass I face. Was that good? I pass filter. Sure does. Looks like an HPF to me. Yeah. Yeah. I pass filter. So are there a couple ways we can make a high pass filter? Didn't we make a high pass filter before using a resistor and a coil, but I had the coil on the output tap and that resulted in a high pass filter. Can I also build a high pass filter using a cap and a resistor, but putting my cap at the top and my resistor here? Interesting that I can do a high pass filter with a coil resistor combination and with a cap resistor combination. Okay, now I'm going to do a cap and resistor again. So we are going to do this guy here. Here's my resistor. Here's my cap. Here's my V out. And my X of C is here, my R is here, 10 volt peak is here. How does this behave? This behaves like a fixed R over here, and it behaves like a variable ohms here. on output. Okay, that's kind of how it behaves. How are we going to analyze this? What have we done in the past? How are you going to draw things out? What have we done here? What have we done here? What have we done here? What have we done in each of these cases? In each of these cases, didn't we draw an arrow for low frequency? Example, didn't we draw an arrow for high frequency? Over here, didn't we draw an arrow for low frequency, another arrow for high frequency? Didn't we draw an arrow for low frequency and another arrow for high frequency? Well, guess what we're gonna do here? Nothing different. We're gonna do this this way. At low F, and then over here, at high F. Now keep in mind, this is a consider. So how does X sub C behave? X sub C is given with this formula, one over two pi F C. And we already determined that the relationship between these two guys is what? Is this directly proportional or inversely proportional? What do we have here? Andrew. They are in inver, inverted no they're proportional yeah, okay. no they're, they're proportional aren't they well if the f is in the denominator no they're not if my f is in the denominator my x sub c is out here they're stated to be inversely proportional okay they are okay. not they're not in any in any way directly proportional they're inversely proportional because f is in the denominator. They would be directly proportional only if you saw this formula without any one over F oh, okay. and X of L here are said to be directly proportional, but the moment I introduce a one over, then anything in the denominator compared to this side is said to be inversely proportional. So these are inversely proportional. So the formula is given by whether this is a cap or a coil. And if it's a cap, this is a formula for cap, for cap capacitive reactants. So we have an inverse proportional relationship. If it's a coil, it's given by this formula. X is equal to two pi FL, where we have a direct proportional relationship. That being said, let's go ahead and take this apart and analyze this. So, X sub C at low frequencies, how does your X sub C change? At low frequency, X sub C 
is going to be equal to high or low. If it's inversely proportional, it should behave in the opposite direction. So what should this be, Christian? Low or high ohms? High. This should be high ohms. And where are those ohms? Are those ohms at the, are the high ohms at the top of the circuit or the high ohms at the output? They will be in the output, no? Yeah, because they are, this is physically on the output tap. So this is high ohms. So this means, so your V out should be high, okay? Over here at high frequencies, because these are inversely proportional, my X sub C is going to be low ohms. And where are those low ohms? Those low ohms are on the output. And if it's low here compared to something, if this were 10 and that were 1,000, then what's my V out? My V out is going to be high, right? Pulling. If my ohms are going to be low, my ohms on the output are going to be low. Again, your voltage divider says low ohms on the output, I will have low V out. Now, I didn't mean to skip this, but what may be helpful is if we go ahead and draw the circuit examples and pop in some numbers here, okay? That might be helpful for us. We did this with every example so far. Let's go ahead and do that here. So low frequency, high ohms. How high? Let's say this is 100K ohms for X sub C. The R was still fixed at 1K. This is still 10 volt peak. Look, which side has X sub C is high and X sub C is on the output. So my V out. Where will most of the 10 volts be? Most of the 10 volts will be across X sub C, which is measured across the output. So my output is expected to be high. So what will happen as a consequence in this case, we have this, let's summarize. Most ohms on output. So V out is gonna be equal to high. That being said, if I were to draw a frequency response graph right here, where I have low and I have high on this side, F in Hertz, and right here will be my V out, and the max is 10 volt peak. When you go to do the voltage divider, what does this V out work out to be? 0.9 volts peak out here. So 10 is here. And at low frequencies, I'm going to put my red line right there. That This graph represents what's happening at low frequencies. Let's see what's happening at high frequencies on this side. So at high frequencies, because X of C and F are inversely proportional. High frequencies equals low ohms. And where are those ohms? Those ohms are on the output. Well, to help us vet better visualize this, I'll just go ahead and take a moment and draw this guy in. And how low could my X sub C go? Well, let's say it went low down to 10 ohms. This guy is still 1,000 ohms for the R. So volt peak, that hasn't changed. So if I get 1,000 here and I got 10 here, where is the majority of my voltage going to be dropped? Most ohms on R. So small ohms on X of C, so V out. Is it going to be equal to high or low? Question goes to uh, Gabriel. 
Is my V out going to be high or low? Low. This is going to be low. And if we agree that it's going to be low, at what frequencies? All of this is when frequencies are high. X sub C is low, V out is low, ohms are small, V out is low. All of this leads us to draw a red line here. How do I connect these two red lines with an S? What kind of a filter does this look like to you all? Where is most of the voltage going to be at which side of the frequency response, low Hello. or high? Yeah, so what kind of filter would you call this? This would be nicknamed a? Low pass filter. LPF, low pass filter, right there, low pass filter. We did, a we did a resistor cap circuit before. Here was the other resistor cap circuit. And with this resistor cap circuit, since the cap was at the top and the resistor was here, we go through the analysis. What happens at low frequencies? We have high ohms. Where are those high ohms? Most of the voltage will be across high ohms up there, but that leaves very little voltage on the V out because those are low ohms. So that's why this guy is drawn down here at low frequencies, low frequencies, high ohms on the cap, low ohms on the R, low voltage on the output. That's why it's down here. The other path over this way at high frequencies, low ohms, means that the output has most, most of the ohms is across the resistor. So most voltage will be across the R. So my V out will be very high. And that's why I draw that red line there connect the dots, I have a high pass filter using a cap and a resistor. If I switch the position of the cap and the resistor, same cap, same resistor, but now the position is switched, I ch change the filter dramatically so it becomes this. So this filter discussion takes you through four different variations of coil and resistor combinations in order for us to see the four different variations of low pass, high pass, low pass, high pass. So coil and resistor, coil and resistor. Coil and resistor over here gave us a high pass. Coil and resistor over here gave us low pass. Cap and resistor here gave us a high pass and cap and resistor over here gave us low pass. So four filters based on just these two components. Now, next thing we'll talk about is resonant filters. Resonance and resonant frequency. Now, this is what happens if I happen to have, here's low and here's high. This is frequency in units of Hertz. And with a coil, I'm going to have X sub L. What was my formula for X sub L? 2 pi F L. And here we said that the unique relationship between these two guys was directly proportional. That meant as frequency goes down, X sub L also goes down. As frequencies go up, X sub L also goes up. How does that behave graphically? The way this behaves graphically, it's pretty linear. As frequencies go up, my output's gonna go up. 
So this is going to look something like this. Like that. Okay. For X sub L um, based on frequency and the amount of ohms that we're likely to see. It's fairly linear. If I double, if I double my frequency, I double my ohms. If I triple my frequency, I triple my ohms. That's what this is going to look like. However, with a cap, I'm going to have something called X sub C. And X sub C, we determined earlier, was 1 over 2 pi FC. We determined earlier that they have a different relationship here and here. These are inversely proportional. So as frequencies go down, X sub L, X sub C, I'm sorry, goes up. That's an arrowhead. That's a comma. As frequency go up, comma, we expect X sub C to come down. How do I graph this here? So at low frequencies, that's this one here. As frequencies go down, where's my ohms? Up. So this is going to start up here. As frequencies go higher, that's this guy here, frequency goes up, I'm now on this side, my ohms are going to be demonstrated going which way? Down. That's here. Now this is not a linear relationship. This comes down like so. Okay. So if I have a circuit that has a cap and a coil, there is a very unique frequency where these two guys are the same. Right here, my X sub C is equal to X sub L at one very special frequency. That frequency is given as FR, my resonant frequency. And that's what we've been talking about for some time is this thing called resonance and resonant frequency. So any questions about this so far? Now, let's go ahead and give you this. That formula for resonant frequency is called FR. And FR is equal to 1 over 2 pi square root of L times C. That's how we can calculate. If you happen to have a cap and a coil in the same circuit, we can calculate resonant frequency. And based on that frequency, and how we build that circuit, we would be able to determine what type of uh, filter we have. Do we have high pass, low pass, band pass, band stop, and how it behaves. So again, resonance is where X of C and X of L actually intersect each other, where the ohms are the same amount of ohms that determines a very special frequency where they do meet, these two graph lines meet, and that frequency is given as F lowercase r, it's called resonant frequency, and resonant frequency formula is given as 1 over 2 pi square root of L times C. Okay, so this is resonance and resonant frequency, and then resonant filters. And with resonant filters, you will have uh, a mnemonic. Because we've learned several mnemonics along the way. Remember Eli the Iceman and such? Well, there's a mnemonic to help 
you remember what happens with resonant filters. And the mnemonics, there's two. You have S, R, S, and P, R, O. S, R, S stands for series, resonance, short. P, R, O is parallel, resonance, open. Series resonance short, parallel resonance open. And we're going to have resonant filters whenever we have a cap and a coil. So for example, if I were to show you something like this, cap, coil, with a resistor. So my output will be here be out. And here's my R. 1K. 10 volt peak. Key number simple. Doesn't matter what those are. Do I have a cap and a coil? And are they in series or are they in parallel? What do I have in this arrangement? Andrew. The cap and the coil. Are they in series or are they in parallel? They are in series. No, are yeah, they, series. They share a current common current path, yes? Yes. All of these are in series. This is a series circuit. And so uh, as they are in series, but in particular, the cap and the coil are attached to each other in series at the top of the circuit, and I have a resistor on the output. So when you see this arrangement, guess what? You're going to think of which memory tool you're going to think of. So these guys are in series. These guys are in series. So you're going to immediately think of SRS. And SRS says, it's a mnemonic, it's a memory tool. Because of where they are at, this circuit behaves like, the circuit here behaves like this. Here's my V out. So when I have these guys together, is there any ohms that's going to appear here? None, because they behave like a what? If they're in series, at resonance, they will behave like a short. I'll define resonance for you in a little bit. But if they are in series, they behave how? As a short. And as a short, it means it behaves like a bare piece of wire. So if it behaves like a bare piece of wire, my 10 volt peak, am I going to lose any of that 10 volts at the top of the circuit? Nothing on the bare piece of wire. Where is my 10 volts going to appear across the resistor? So my V out is equal to the full 10 volts. What this particular circuit behaves like in a frequency response is this. There's low and there's high, but with resonance, we happen to have a very unique frequency, FR, and this is your resonant frequency. And if all of my ohms appear here on the output, then what will happen here is at resonance, I will draw my red line this way. And how will the rest of the frequency change from this 
point on. It'll drop off in a bell-shaped curve like so. It'll drop off in a bell-shaped curve like so. Does this look like one of the four kinds of filters that I showed you back at the uh, chapter 26 of our textbook? Who remembers what this was called? That the band pass? Does this, yes, does this look suspiciously? These illustrations in chapter 26 of your textbook. Now, there is a middle frequency we call the resonant frequency. And at resonant frequency, we have very unique characteristics. Um, but we will have a very high peak at that resonant, at that, at that frequency point. And from there, the frequency drops off, the amplitude drops off on either side. It can have a very spiky shape output or it could have a more rounded bell shape output. Each one of these has a very specific benefit. I would use a very spiky uh, shape for tuning radio frequencies, tuning your cellular frequencies, tuning your television frequencies. Uh, so everything where we're tuning in a certain frequency to receive cable, satellite, frequencies on your radio, frequencies on your, your uh, cell phones, we want this type of a shape here. Where do we want this type of a shape? We want this type of a shape if we're building a speaker box. If we're building a speaker box, and here's an example uh, in your textbook of tweeter, mid-range, and woofer. And so for the mid-range, we would want this type of a shape, a resonant shape for the mid-range. A low-pass filter here for the bass, a high-pass filter over here, the tweeter, but for the mid-range driver, we really want to have a nice wide bell shape with a center frequency somewhere between low and high. And don't you see here, do I have a cap? And do I have a cap and a coil in series with each other? Isn't that interesting? So these two guys in series at the top of the circuit will give us a bandpass filter that would be perfect to be used for the mid-range driver of your louder system. Okay, and that is known as over here, band pass filter. So we want that rounded shape for where we're tuning for, say, our loudspeaker filters, and we want that spiky shape for what? What do you want to remember about the spiky shape? Band pass. Where do we want to use this? Phones, computers. For your cell phones for your uh, digital satellite tuners, for your cable boxes, for your car stereos, when you're tuning in the stereo frequencies, that's where you want this type of filter, okay? Where you're tuning in a certain frequency you wanna to listen to. What's your favorite Boon Chukka Hi-Fi station on FM? 99.7 or no, whatever it is, okay, 108.3, whatever that frequency is, guess what you're tuning into? That frequency there, that resonant frequency, and you want this to be spiky, you want this to be narrow because you don't want that radio station to interfere with the one next to it or the one next to it to interfere with this. That's why this wants, you want this to be narrow. And there are ways of, of determining the shapes of these, which are not part of this discussion. It's part of a different um, class in electronics as to how, we, how do we determine the shape. But right now, what it is that you have is something known as bandpass filter. And we can achieve that in this particular case with our example by having bring this back up here. we can achieve that in this particular case by having the series cap and coil at the top of the circuit this will behave like so suppose i take this circuit put the resistor at the top Put the cap and the coil here. And now my V out. What applies here? I have a coil and a cap. Are they in series or are they in parallel? The coil and the cap. Question goes to uh, Rolando. Uh, they're, they're in series. They're still in series. 
Okay. These guys are still in series. That relationship hasn't changed in series. What's changed is the position. So this means we're still going to apply SRS, series resonance short. So that will allow me to derive a circuit that in this case, here, here, this is my V out. So I have an R, an R, whatever it is, let's say it's still 1K ohms. And here I have a short, remember, series resonance, this behaves like a short. This is a bare piece of wire. So if I have 10 peak over here, I have 1K over here, a wire has how many ohms? How many ohms on a bare piece of wire, Pauline? Uh, zero. It's very close to zero ohms. So the voltage will drop where I have the majority of ohms. Where will this voltage be dropped? Will it be dropped across this bare piece of wire or will my voltage be across this resistor? It'll be in the my voltage, it'll be across the resistor. So how do I summarize what happens here? What do I summarize what happens here is as SRS prevails, my V out is going to be equal to very low It is approximately zero volts because I have zero ohms because my ohms on output equal approximately zero ohms. So I will have very, very little output. V out's going to be zero. So V out's going to be zero volts. How do I draw this in a frequency response graph? Hmm. I have, let's say, low, and there will be a resonant frequency, FR, and this will be high. And there will be a resonant frequency right here. And this is my resonant frequency. So how do I do, where do I draw a red dash in the midst of all of this for, at that frequency, my output being nothing? I'm going to put it down here. If I put it down here, how does the rest of the response behave as I go higher in this direction and higher, lower in that direction? It will respond like this. behaves the opposite of this. So where this particular guy was known as a BPF, a band pass filter, this guy is known as a BSF, which is a band stop filter. all by changing the position of where the cap and coil combination sits. In the first case, it sat at the top, gave us this response because of SRS. In the second case, it sat at the output, gave us this response, again, because of SRS, series resonance short. So the location of where this pair sits, either at the top or on the output, has everything to do with how these guys behave in terms of frequency response. Interesting. Now, if I go to move my combination here,
All right. And here I have my V out. What is the relationship between the cap and the resistor in this particular case compared to the resistor over here? These guys happen to be what relationship to each other? In parallel. Parallel, precisely. So that brings us to the other mnemonic, P-R-O, where we parallel resonance open. And these guys behave fundamentally like this. I have a resistor. They behave like an open. Um, let me draw it this way because these guys are going to be so high. My R is still here. This is going to be how high? Mm, let's say infinite ohms. Okay, and here I still have my 1k ohms. Mm -hmm. If I have infinite ohms here, and another way to draw this to help you out, another way to draw this would be like this. V out. And here I still have infinite ohms, except I'm drawing it physically as an open. I still have my resistor, and it's still 1K. 10 volt peak, 10 volt peak. I'm hooking up either a voltmeter or an oscope to measure my V out. What am I gonna measure? Again, this is a simple voltage divider. Ohms here, ohms here. Most of the voltage will always be dropped across the highest ohms. So where will most of this 10 volts be? Will my, this 10 volts be across this resistor or will it be across the open? Question goes to uh, Pauline. It will go uh, to the open. It will go to where I have the most ohms, and the most ohms is the open, okay? So what type of a frequency response do we expect from something like this? The frequency response we expect here, here's my F, here's this here, and there will be a resonant frequency, FR. I will have maximum voltage on my output. So at resonance, at that frequency, what will happen is my V out is equal to maximum. So where am I gonna draw my red bar? I'm gonna draw my red bar right up here at maximum. How will this shape? This will shape down this way on this side, and this will shape this way on this side. What type of a filter do we call that? This guy, Cortez, what do I call this? This is the band pass? This is a band pass filter. and pass filter. If I were to take, here's my circuit, and now over here, coil, capacitor, here's my resistor, here's my C, here's my L, here's my V out. What is the relationship between the cap and the coil? Are 
are they in series or in parallel? Parallel. So P R O parallel resonance open. How does this guy behave? Behaves like. I have this. This guy is open. This is where I have infinite ohms. The R, I have this puny 1K ohm. My V out is here. My 10 volt peak is over here. There's my 10 volt peak. So if I have an open here, can any current flow? Nope. If no current can flow, can there be any voltage across this resistor? And if there's no voltage across here, what will my V out be? My V out will be what? High or low? No current, no current, Should be low. no voltage, no ohms, uh, no current, no voltage. How low? Zero volt. Zero. Yeah. So if I were to draw my frequency response graph for this guy, there's low. There's high, and somewhere here we have this magical frequency, FR, zero volt. How do I draw my red bar in here? Am I gonna draw it high or am I gonna draw it low? Draw it low down here. How will this shape? This will shape like this. This will shape like this. What do I call this? BSF. Band stop filter. Because here the principle that we want to remember is PRL stands for parallel resonance open. And if I've got these guys in parallel, it will behave like they're open, which means we got a infinite ohms on the output. So at resonance, at very special frequency, what happens at resonance is if my open is here, all the ohms are here, then all the voltage is going to be, those ohms are, my V out is going to be at maximum. I have what's known as a bandpass filter. If I change the position of the two parallel guys to go to the top of the circuit, again, I have PRO because they're parallel. So parallel resonance open. This behaves like an open with infinite ohms at the top of the circuit. Where will this 10 volts be? Up here. Will I have anything left over here? None. Therefore, this output is going to be down here at the bottom. Have a band stop filter. These are resonant filters in series, giving me band pass, giving me band stop. These are resonant filters in parallel, giving me band pass and band stop. And that's why in each one of these illustrations, resonant frequency was our center point of our bell-shaped curve, whether the bell-shaped curve starts with the output high. If the output is high at the bell-shaped curve, we have a band pass. If my output is low at resonant frequency, we have a band stop. What do you need to know and remember out of all of this is I'll conjure up a nice worksheet for you, uh, for you all to do and basically fill in the blanks, okay? So it'll be a concept. Um, you'll be asked, what is SRS? What is PRO? What is resonance? Resonance is defined when these two values are the same. Resonant frequency is the frequency at which these two values are the same. How do I calculate resonant frequency? Resonant frequency is calculated here. What is the relationship between frequency and reactance in a coil? They are directly proportional. 
what is the relationship between frequency and reactance in a cap. They are inversely proportional. So those are the things that you need to hold. Resonant filters. That is one example of resonant filters. And then the other example of resonant filters we gave you via previous page right here. So two pages of resonant filters, one page of resonant frequency, and a whole bunch of pages here on cap resistor filters. And then we have coil resistor filters. And then we have the relationship between contrast between X sub L to X sub C. And then the title page of our discussion, starting with filters, low pass, high pass, band pass, band stop, FRG, frequency response graph. The vertical axis is a measure of what? Amplitude. In what units? Voltage or in decibels. Horizontal axis is a measure of what? Frequency. In what units? Hertz. This side represents what frequencies? Low. This side represents what frequencies? High. What is the definition of amplitude? Signal strength. What is the definition of audio? Range of frequencies that humans can hear. Any questions about filters? It's a very, very comprehensive set of, of notes that we've gone through today. Uh, and, and you'll have the YouTube to be able to uh, um, review and absorb this and you'll have a question set that uh, I will be building tomorrow or Friday, um, depending upon a number of other factors that'll help you review all of these concepts. Notice that in this particular case, there really are no numeric calculations. I didn't ask you to calculate X sub L. I didn't ask you to calculate X sub C. The only thing we did for any kind of calculations was voltage divider formula that had to do with um, right here, VDF. Remember VDF, voltage divider formula? And we did that initially to get our output voltages. Very high output voltage on the resistor, very low output voltage on the resistor. So we did that initially, and that's the only calculation that we made in the midst of, of all the rest of this. The rest of this, these I have to do understanding the concepts of how coil resistor circuits behave. Coil resistor circuits behave here. Cap resistor circuits to give us this high pass filter. Cap resistor circuits to give us this low pass filter. And then when we resonant filters is when we put them cap and coil in series at the top or a cap and coil in series in the output to give us the respective band pass or band stop filters because we're utilizing SRS series resonance short and the other resonant filter having to do with these fellows in parallel so we're using the other mnemonic parallel resonance open and depending upon whether that parallel pair is on the output or that parallel pair is at the top of the circuit gave us the respective outputs of filter responses there. What is this thing called resonance? Resonance is where the, the, the graphs of X sub C and X sub L actually intersect. And where they intersect, I mean these zones are exactly equal to each other, there happens to be a very special frequency at which they intersect. That frequency where they intersect is called resonant frequency, FR, given with this calculation. And that was the basis of our work with parallel resonance as well as with series resonance um, and how these bell-shaped curves develop around a center frequency called resonant frequency. So that is a summary of our filter discussion today. Any general questions for me before we go into the next category?